the people of God say amen. Would you hold hands with somebody for 60 seconds and just pray for that person for 60 seconds out loud, not quiet, out loud. Come on. Pray for them. Pray for them. Pray for them. That's it. Come on. Come on. Come on. That's it. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Twenty more seconds. Turn that thing up. Come on. for this moment. We thank you for this time. We thank you for the testimonies, the encouragement, the motivation to give by faith. I believe there's about to be a transfer of wealth because we believe you. And God, we're going to continue to believe you and sow into your kingdom because we believe there's about to be a shift in every house in this room. We give you glory. I said we give you glory. And we give you praise in Jesus' name. Come on. While you're clapping, can we clap our hands for our leaders? Can we bless God for both of them? Thank you so much, your generosity, your kindness. Can you clap your hands for each other? I want to call your attention to Matthew 25, chapters 1 through 3. If you remain standing, and let's read this word together. I really want to teach this word like Sunday school, if you'll let me. Um, At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps, but did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish one said to the wise, give us some of your oil. Our lamps are gone out. No, they replied. There may not be enough for both of us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the uh, the others also came out, Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, truly, I tell you, I don't know you. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. If you look at verse 2 again, five of them were foolish and five of them were wise. 
I want you to look at somebody. I'm going to give you my topic, and I want you to ask them this question. Which one are you? You may be seated. Which one are you? While dispensationalists divide on whether this parable relates to the rapture of the church or the second advent following the tribulation, both views introduce an eschatological structure, eschatology, the end time. The parable was told by Jesus and it's been debated or discussed because of its allegorical components. Allegory meaning symbolisms. And the symbolisms in the text are the bridegroom coming basically means the son of man. The ten virgins would be the expectant Christian community. I'm, I'm giving this to you so you can write it down. The tarrying equals the delay of the second coming. And the rejection of the foolish virgins would equal the final judgment, which presents a timing crisis, an eschatological crisis. Now, you only get one life to live on this earth. And I think you know that. You don't get to come back and maximize after you die. So if you don't maximize now, there is no guarantee that you get a next to maximize. And I know we prophesy that we're going to get 100 years, we're going to get 75 years, and we're supposed to prophesy that. We're supposed to speak life and death is in the power of the tongue. However, Scripture also tells us that no one knows, not even Jesus, when the Son of Man shall come back. So you don't have to die to leave. You could be raptured and taken away from here. So you only get one time, somebody shout one time. You only get one time to maximize. And if that is the case, then timing is critical to this text. It is not the substratum of the text, but it is very critical to the text. And with that being known, then we look at two types of time. Somebody say chronological time and psychological time. Chronological time, we know that is measured by hours, seconds, minutes, and it is measured the same no matter what, but it's not always valued the same. It's valued individually. All of us do not value the hours the same or the seconds the same, but they are measured the same. When you look at psychological time, psychological time is when you take an experience and it's tied to a time. So the month of April means this to you because of that. Or the month of May means this to you because of this. Or when you meet somebody, they remind you of something. And psychologically, it takes you somewhere. But here's the issue with that. Where you are psychologically, emotionally, and spiritually will affect your perception of time or times. So however you are, your mental health, your, 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 your physical health, your spiritual health will determine how you perceive time. So God wants to do something for you and he'll drop you in time. He'll drop you in a moment for it to be a Kairos moment, special time. But if your perception, your spirit, your, 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 your entire makeup is twisted because of pain, and frustration and depression and hurt, you will miss that time. You will misinterpret what God's trying to do for you because psychologically you haven't taken the time to do the healing. Spiritually, you haven't prayed enough, you haven't worshiped enough, you haven't stayed devoted enough to make sure that you are prepared for what God wants to do for you. So it is your job not just to pray, but it is your job to make sure that you're around the right people to make sure you can foster a healing environment, to make sure that you can continue to be in an atmosphere where you're not wasting your time. So if that is the case, the next thing I want you to write down is the first point in the message is recognize the time. 
You got to recognize the time. Now, Matthew 25 and 1 says, at the time the kingdom of heaven will be like 10 virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. I just told you that this is a uh, eschatological conversation, but this is actually the answer to a question from the previous chapter in verse 24. And Jesus is using this marriage to answer this end time question. The bridegroom and the bride are about to be married and also describe the relationship of Christ and the church. So the parable of the ten virgins is an answer to the question that they were asked him this. They said, what is the sign? When are you coming back? So then he gives them this parable. Is the parable a true story? No. A parable is a fable or it's a story to get you to understand the spiritual structure that God's trying to explain. So he takes this parable and he tries to get them to understand that no man knows when I'm coming. So the kingdom of heaven is like ten virgins. All right? That's where you get that from. So he's answering this and he's telling you, you got to maximize your time. But this is what he does. He says, you will hear wars and rumors of wars, deceptive imitators of my name, famines, earthquakes, nations rising against each other, people turning away from the faith, betraying and hating each other. And the increase of wickedness will cause the love of many to wax cold. This is what he said. This is the sign. Now, if this is the sign, that doesn't mean you don't maximize yourself in those conditions. If love is waxing cold, you still got to search for it. If wars and wars are going around, you still got to try to make peace. So when you're maximizing yourself, you got to understand you're going to be in a chaotic place trying to make it happen. So if you know it's chaotic, you don't let the chaos make you walk away from being a creator of your destiny. You have to use the word of God knowing I understand the times. He told me about the times that there's going to be wars and people are going to be cold-blooded. And if they're going to be cold-blooded, that should not catch me off guard. Because the word of God is telling me this is the kind of time that you're going to be living in. So you think you're just going to sit there and the devil's going to let you maximize yourself in front of nothing? You're going to have to maximize yourself in front of bad information, in front of haters, in front of killers, in front of people who want to frustrate you, in front of people who want to rob you, in front of people who try to scandalize your name. It's going to be up to you. Do you allow your psychology to stop you from going after what God has already promised you? Or do you maximize yourself in front of the devil's face? Do you maximize yourself in front of lack, in front of frustration? You've got to get the nerve to look the devil in his face and tell him, God already told me about you. Good God Almighty. You have to tell him, I already know that you came to bring war. I already know that you came to try to steal my joy. I was prepared for you. I woke up this morning, like my grandmama say, with my mind stayed on him. You have to prepare for increase. He's not just going to let you do it. You have to get strategy and you have to be prepared for what he wants to do. Somebody shout, recognize the times. Recognize. Psalms 31 and 15, put that in your notes. The Bible says, my times are in your hands. That means whatever's happening with me, the good and the bad, all Things work together. Do you understand that? So you have to know that your times, that means I have to decide to do a better job with my role that's in my hands. Because if, if my times are in his hands, and that means he says, I got you regardless. And if he has me regardless, that should let you know. You can walk by faith if you sit yourself in his hands. But that doesn't mean you don't have a role to play in your own future. 
You've got to grab whatever it is that God told you you can do. You've got to recognize the time, and then you've got to get in and move by faith. And sometimes you may be shaking in your pants or in your skirt. But whatever you're shaking in, you better step in faith and quote scriptures and pray out loud. Do whatever you got to do to get the job done because the times are not going to catch you off guard. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. The time that it's going to take to make something happen is only serious to those who are making it happen. Did you hear what I just told you? The time that it's going to take to make something happen, it's only serious to the person that's trying to make it happen. That's why you can't waste time sharing your plans with everybody because they don't take it serious. It's only serious to the one that's trying to make it happen. And in this text, there are two lenses that this parable allows us to see through. The lens of wisdom and the lens of foolishness. Which one are you? The Oxford Dictionary says that wisdom is the capacity of judging rightly in matters relating to life and conduct, soundness of judgment, and in the choice of means and ends. Wisdom combines the fundamentally practical knowledge of how to live well with the appropriate practical response to that knowledge. To live well is to have high-level well-being. And well-being is simply this, the state of one's life when one's life is well. Being wise then means knowing that what's leading me or what I'm doing constitutes human well-being and I'm motivated to pursue well-being. You should be able to determine who's well by conversation, by their attitude, by, what, by, by how they even approach you. You should be in a position with God spiritually, psychologically, mentally, whatever you want to call it. You should be in a place with God so well, not that you're trying to judge people, that you can discern their psychology. You ought to know as soon as you sense that spirit, that's not for me, even if it's fine. Y'all ain't saying nothing to me. Even if that body is fine, you still ought to be able to say, you fine, but I don't need you. You understand what I'm saying? You got to be strong enough to understand that what I have is too powerful to flirt with you. Y'all ain't saying nothing to me in this house this morning. How many of you know you got something? How many of you know you got something? Then if you know you got something, you've got to remember when you start messing with nothing. And if you got something, you should know what something feels like. When you got something that feels a certain way, I don't know if I'm talking to anybody. You know, have y'all ever got that feeling when you know something getting ready to happen? And you just kind of, it's kind of, it feels good. You dance to music that don't even exist. Because you know you what? You got something. And when you got something, you carry yourself different. You can be in house shoes and a wife beater and still feel fine. Because you know you got something. When you got something, you can't just walk up to me and tell me anything and make me feel bad. Say what you want to say. I got something. Are y'all understanding what I'm saying? Look at two or three people and tell them, I got something, I got something, I got something. Well, remember that, remember that when you don't feel it, because you, you, you won't always feel it. And when people approach you and come into your life, you have to still be able to recognize the time. Watch this in Proverbs 4. This is your next note, Proverbs 4, 6 through 9. Do not forsake wisdom, and she will protect you. Love her, and she will watch over you. The beginning of wisdom is this. Get wisdom. Watch this. Though it cost all you have, get understanding. Cherish her, and she will exalt you. Not your boyfriend, not your girlfriend, not your boss. Wisdom is going to exalt you. Embrace her. 
and she will honor you. Verse 9, she will give you a garland of grace on your head and present you with a glorious crown. Are you understanding what this says? Wisdom is going to put you in a place like a champion. Wisdom will set you up and put a, a garland is what they put on, on the Olympian's head. Going to put a garland of grace around your head so that when you walk around, you're walking around with grace. You're walking around with power. You are a display of God's glory. All because you chose to get wisdom before you got with them. Oh, y'all still here with me? Somebody shout, get wisdom, get wisdom. I've got to get wisdom, I've got to get wisdom. Now, what, what, let's look at this. Foolishness, then, is the lack of everything we just said. It's the lack of good sense. It's the lack of judgment. And look what he says in 1 Corinthians 3, 18 and 19. Do not deceive yourself. If any of you think you are wise by the standards of this age, you should become fools so that you could become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness in God's sight as it is written. Watch this. He catches the wise in their craftiness. What is he talking about? He ain't talking about the same wisdom that we just talked about. He's talking about dark wisdom, wisdom outside of the knowledge of God. So when you got all of these friends that's trying to tell you that you don't need the word of God and they got all this other stuff, that's dark wisdom. You should be able to have a conversation with them and they not influence you because of what you possess. But you still should be able to stand with the garland of grace on your head and they respect what's on your life. How do they respect it? By your action. You're loving on wisdom. Wisdom has exalted you. You can't be a Christian and nobody ever see you loving on wisdom and nobody ever see you praising God. Nobody ever see you worshiping God. You're a liar. If you love him, you're going to show it. If you love him, it's going to be... I wish I had a witness in here. I want you to look at somebody and tell them, God... No, that ain't good enough. Say it with power. God doesn't need secret lovers. He don't need no secret lover. He don't need you loving him in your house and you never love him publicly. You never love him out. You need to start loving out loud. People ought to know that you love him. Why would he give you a garland of grace? He gave it so you could be seen. Tell somebody I'm a champion. Well, what good are you to be a secret champion? He doesn't need secret lovers. He wants you to be public. He wants you to be public. But God knows you're not perfect. He knows you're not perfect. That's why he said he covers a multitude of sin. So don't let sin make you think you need to be God's secret. God so loved the world, not the church. He so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He gave his son for the world, not the church. The world then made a decision to love him back. And then it became the church. So nobody in the church should ever look at somebody in the world and turn their nose up because the church came outside of the world. Look at somebody and tell them you came from the world. Quit turning your nose up at people in the world. You came from the world. You came, you used to smoke. You used to drink. You used to have sex. You used to be out all night. Stop acting like you ain't got no past. You came from the world. Good God of mine got happy. Good Jesus. Be seated. That's a good place to give him glory right there. Somebody say, which one are you? Which one are you? 
Now, Jesus wrestled with this. And how do we know this to be true or to be biblical? Because when John the Baptist was alive, John said, is he the one? Or shall we look for another? Jesus has this conversation with Peter when they're in Caesarea Philippi. And he talks to him and he says, who do men say that I am? Peter says, some say you're John the Baptist. Some say you are Elijah. Some say you're just the prophet. But then Jesus asks him, but who do you say that I am? He said, thou art the Christ. He said, flesh and blood did not reveal this unto you. But my Father who is in heaven, if you're going to recognize the time, you're going to have to have a revelation of who he is in your life. Because the times will try to convince you that Jesus ain't enough, that Jesus is not real, and that you don't need him, and that he's some kind of other prophet or some kind of other thing in this religious system. But once you catch a revelation of who he is, not your mama's revelation, not your grandmother's revelation, not your granddaddy's revelation, your own personal revelation that he brought me out of darkness, into the marvelous light. Then you can tell somebody, I know who he is. Jesus. Somebody shout his name. Jesus. Flesh and blood doesn't reveal that to you. You have to have an experience. You have to have an encounter. Which one? Are you? Are you going to come to Max 24? pay your money, give offerings, sit in these sessions, and walk out foolish? Only thing you can say is we had a good time. If that's all you got, you are a fool. You should take these principles Bishop's been teaching Dr. Tracy and the women's panel and start applying these principles to your life. When you start applying principles to your life, if your life is out of order, it's going to feel bad at first. That's how we know you're telling the truth. How you doing? Oh, blessed and highly favored. You're lying if you're applying. Because if you apply it, you're going to have to break down some stuff. You're going to have to tell your sugar daddy bye. you have to tell your sugar mama bye. you have to turn off Hulu. You're going to have to turn off Netflix. You're going to have to turn that car back in. you have to buy a cheaper car. You're going to have to move and get a rent house. You're going to have to figure out how to get everything under control when you really apply in principles. You can't apply principles with my money. Hey, I need to borrow you. I need to borrow $100. You ain't applying nothing. You, when you start applying, it hurts. You may end up missing church. What happened? I tried Jesus. What? That don't even sound right. Until you realize my way does not supersede his way. And I can't, I can't put them together because Jesus ain't yoking with me. I got to yoke with him. And if I yoke with him, where I've been doing this, he ain't down with that. So I got to walk straight. I know y'all like, his yoke is easy and his burden is light. <laughs> Sound real good, don't it? Till you get yoked up with him and he tell you to go apologize to the woman that slept with your husband. Is it easy? Is it light? Not in, the apply, not in the applying phase. When you first try it, you're like, Lord, my God, you're asking too much of me. But then once you get it down, 
then you recognize the easy ain't got nothing to do with me. It's because of him that it's easy. He's helping me carry the load. It's got nothing to do with us sharing it. It's got everything to do with me submitting it. And when I submit it, he's like, come on, I got you. I got you. Let me walk you through this struggle. I know it don't feel good, but it's going to be better if you just keep trusting me. If you just stay with me, I'm going to make it lighter for you. That's what that means. And as you get into him and you catch the revelation and then it becomes a lifestyle, that's the easy that's the light because now you're living by faith. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. So the 10 start out together. They're excited together. The moment is thrilling. There's an expected time for expected people. I see influence and independence at this point of the text. The 10 some kind of way turn into two groups of five. Who influenced who? And how did they remain independent in the separation? How did we get here together? Who spoke up and convinced you to believe another way? That's what happens to all of our lives. We show up together and in some kind of way influence pulls us away from what we've been taught and away from what we know. And then that belief or that hidden leader starts to speak up in your life. Uh, young people, when you go to college, your mama been your leader all this time. Your father been your leader all this time. Your uncle or your cousin been this leader all this time. When you get to college, all of a sudden, John and they know more than your mom and daddy. That's a lie. Now they got you thinking what you've been taught all your 18 years is a lie. You got one revelation with one cup of beer and some yak and some weed and now you feel good. It ought to tell you the revelation is a lie because it came from intoxication. Oh, y'all ain't gonna talk to me like that, huh? I just put myself out there. I've been there. So y'all smoking, y'all getting drunk together and all of a sudden, girl, you know, you shouldn't even be talking like that. I just don't even know you. Girl, I'm trying to tell you, she be having me in church all the time. And I was saying, you know, I don't even really believe like that. Me neither. <laughs> at some point, you ought to wake up and look at yourself and say, look at you. You stupid. That ain't the Holy Ghost. That's the weed. I'm teaching. I don't care what you say. you thinking a whole new revelation now I don't think they were smoking weed I don't know what they were doing <laughs> but, but something happened and caused the separation they have this separation don't post that part y'all because everybody gonna say I'm not preaching the Bible okay so just don't post that uh, uh, they, <laughs> something happens and they separate there's a group of five and a group of five watch this 25 and 3 the foolish ones took their lamps, but did not take any oil with them. Why? I believe their feelings overrode their focus. Let me write that down. I believe their feelings overrode their focus. Why? Because they left without thinking. Okay? If you're going to maximize yourself, you have to start thinking through. Okay? All it simply means is to carefully consider the possible outcomes, all right? You're not fearing preparing, but you're somewhat kind of predicting what might happen if this goes down. What could happen? See, a good leader always plans a plan A, a plan B, and a plan C because something may happen. They leave without any structure, without any plan. They just grab the doggone lamp and got out of there. I don't know why. Maybe they just wanted to be married. Maybe they just wanted to be in the wedding. We don't know. But they took off. But what I thought was interesting, it didn't make the other five move. The other five watched them go. I, I want to pray 
for the five like that. That you don't allow fools to convince you to leave without checking all of your bases. Is this right? 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 Something happened that those five got up and got up out of there, but the other five still remain. And it's also interesting that in the text that they called the foolish first. You would think just from natural reading that the wise would be first because wisdom is like a garland, but he puts the fools out first. What is that telling you? Always watch. A fool is going to move first. Don't be so quick to move. Sit and see who just getting up, who taking off, who want it, who want it so bad that they just I got, got to get it. I got to get it. No, 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 no. You don't even know who it is. You don't even know where you're going. I used to tell my daughters that, well, we going out tonight. Where you going? I don't know. We just going. That's dumb. I want to know where you're going. Well, oh, daddy, if, all of my friends are scared of you. Good. I want to know. I'm not saying you can't go, but I want to know. Because I want the fools to know. I am a real fool. And I will kill you. And still go to heaven. God, he shot out by. So I had a witness in here. <laughs> Them guys used to come to the house, knock on the door, and I'd have a 12 gauge right in my hand. How you doing? <laughs> and a wife beater on. How you doing? Where you taking her? Oh, daddy. I wanted the fool in him to become wise. Yeah, he got a miracle in one second. I wish I had a witness in here. That's how you have to protect. Why, why, why? She's my destiny. She's my seed. That's what you got to do in the spirit, in the natural. Protect what God gave you. When the enemy starts coming up against your children, pull out your spiritual 12 gauge and let him know you can't have my house. You can't have my kids. You can't have my job. You can't have my mind. Standing proxy for my family in the Holy Ghost. Somebody shout hallelujah. Y'all still with me? Second thing I want you to write down. Well, it should be more than the second thing. It's the second point. Working rigorously with both hands. So your first point was recognizing the time. Your second point is working rigorously with what? Both hands. All right, rigorously means extremely thorough in a careful way. You gotta be serious with your concentration. Now there will be a season, a time, and a moment in your life where you're gonna have to get the job done with both hands, okay? Now, if you notice the difference between the foolish and the wise, according to the scripture, they grabbed their torch or their lamp and they took off. The second group, the Bible says, they grabbed the lamp and jars of oil. Not one jar, jars. You can't carry jars and a lamp in the same hand. So that would mean they would have had to squat down, get the jars and the lamp, and walk. What does that mean? I have to be so focused that I don't have time to stop and talk to you. Even if it's loved ones sometimes. Those are the worst at times. Because you see me with my hands full and you're still trying to talk to me and i got things I'm trying to do. You're going to have to get to the point if you're really trying to maximize yourself. You're saying, I got this in front of me and I'm not dropping it. I'm not putting it down. 
because I'm preparing myself for my future. So I'm not sitting it down. If you sit it down, it better be for somebody that's going to do what? So if they're not going to help you and they're just going to sit there and text message and talk and get on Instagram and talk about the past, you need to get your stuff back, put it back in your hand and start walking where you're trying to go because you're trying to maximize yourself. Tell somebody I got both hands full, 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 both hands full. Wives, you have to tell your husband, carry that because I can't carry it right now. I got, I got both hands full. Husbands, you have to tell your wife, I can't carry it right now. You carry it. I got both hands full. I mean, you're after something. That's what it looks like. You can see a person's focus because you don't see them everywhere. Hey, girl, I ain't seen you in a long time. Hey, man, I ain't seen you in a long time. No, you saw me. You just haven't never seen me with my hands full. Because when I got my hands full, I don't have time to be on the phone talking to you. I got homework. I'm trying to make it happen. I'm trying to build a family. I'm trying to build a house. I'm trying to build a career. I'm trying to change my world. I don't have time in this season to sit down and hear your same story about John and James. I got my hands. Got my hands full. When I was working on my doctorate, I had to wake up at four o'clock and read. I couldn't read at night because I couldn't read all of them books quiet. I go to sleep. So I figured it out. I get up when everybody sleep and I walk through the house reading out loud. I walk outside reading out loud. My hands were full. I could do all of my work in the day. In the evening I had other stuff I was doing. I went ahead and went to bed early because I knew I had to get back up because my hands was full. People will look at your routine and tell you got something going on. You don't have to explain yourself. Just let them see you with your hands full. You become the example for your family, for your friends. It may be tough in the beginning, but when they start seeing the success in your life, you created a pattern for them that becomes software for them to download. And they say, I watched my cousin Joel. I watched my cousin Jenny. I watched my brother Samson. He has his hands full and he didn't lose his mind. He was simply focused. Do you have any idea what the focus you could accomplish? If you've been able to do everything that you're doing now and you're all over the place, unorganized, what do you think would happen if you focus yourself? If you focus on the one thing, see, that's what, I can do a lot of stuff. A lot of stuff. And I got busy doing a whole lot of stuff. Doing it really good. But I want to do it up here. And you can't do all of that up here doing all of this at the same time. So you got to lay some of it down. I'm good at this, but not right now. I'll touch it from time to time. So I have to look through my Rolodex of gifts and purpose and say, I'm going to focus on this. And I'm going to make this thing so good that it wakes up all these things that I laid down to make it happen. It took me a long time to realize that because I had all these other things and I'm like, I got to get busy doing this and I got to get busy doing that and I became a busy body. But then when I focused, let me, let me, let me, let me see. Everything that you do, Joel, is wrapped around communication. Can you sing? Yes. Are you a musician? Yes. You love real estate? Yes. You're a coach? You love fitness? Yes. And a myriad of other things. But my Lord said to me, you're a speaker. Work on your speaking. Practice your speaking. So I started walking around outside. I'd look at a tree. Because that's what my bishop told me. I would sit at dinner with Bishop Jakes. 
He put a salt shaker out there and say, preach on that salt shaker. I'm like, oh, no, I can't do that. Then he'd do it. I'm like, oh, God, I'm definitely not going to do it after you. <laughs> For a whole year, I wouldn't do it. Then the second year, I tried it. And it was terrible. But it was my first try, and it was in front of the greatest communicator on the planet. He said, keep trying it. Keep trying it. I was at home. I said, well, you know what? The reason why it's terrible because I don't ever practice at home. And I'm only practicing in front of him. So I went home, started putting that salt shaker down there. I went outside, started putting the salt shaker in the tree. I started pouring the salt shaker on meat. I poured it on me. I tried to get the salt out any kind of way. Let it come out the little bitty holes, pour it out the big hole. Getting different revelations of how that salt got out, how that salt got in, what that salt could do if you used it and what it didn't if you didn't. I just started talking about it. And before you know it, I went to the restaurant with him and I said, boom. If you pour that salt in the water, it will make it cloudy. It will also change the taste. And it depends on the taste buds. They will determine whether you enjoy salty water or fresh water. At this particular point in time, you cannot make it fresh again. So whatever the salt hits, it seasons and it changes. That is the potency of the salt. That whatever it puts itself in, it cultivates and it changes and it turns. That helps me to understand why we are the salt of the earth. And Bishop said, oh my God, now you got it, son. Start getting better and better and better and better. And then I started preaching from churches that was two, three hundred to two thousand, three thousand, four thousand, five thousand, just all the time in front of hundreds of thousands of people. But it started with practice. Now that has turned into multiple streams. Okay? And then, and she can tell you this all day, once you get it at a certain level, then people want your brand. They want your influence. For which, so what you were working so hard to do in so many different lanes, you can perfect the one thing and then a person from the lane you were working in will say, man, how can I help you in this side? Because I've been watching you and you blessed my child's life. I blessed your child's life. Yeah, you blessed my child's life. I want to help you on this endeavor. So what do you do? You take that preaching hat off and you put that real estate hat on and you come over here and you don't act like you know everything. You just talk about what he wanted, your influence. And before you know it, you will have created multiple streams of income because you got the one thing right. I wish I had a witness in it. They must don't believe what I'm saying. How about somebody and tell them, get the one thing right, the one thing. So you got to get both hands full with the one thing. Go back to college. Go back to vocational school. If you want to be an entrepreneur, find a mentor. Get busy. Put both hands to work. You got to be so cold with both hands that you're ambidextrous. I'll knock a tree down with the left just as well as I can with the right. You got to be cold with it. If they tell, Bishop Jake used to tell me this. I don't know why I'm on this. I'm sorry, but I think it's helping somebody. When I first went to him, I was a hardcore Pentecostal preacher. And the only thing people heard me do was hoop and holler and scream. And I'm good at it. And uh, he told me, you got a big old right hand. Take that right hand, tie it behind your back, and teach Bible study with your left hand. I said, what? He said, I want that jab to get so tight that people see you as a thinker. They see how sharp you are with your left hand. He said, now, we're not going to get rid of the right. We're just going to tie it behind our back. He said, because there's some teachers that ain't got no right. He said, and there's some preachers that's got a right that don't have a left. He said, so if you get good enough, you'll be able to be in both fields at the same time. You know, but you still got to get this thing right. So I started learning how to teach, 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 teach. To when every now and then if I want to teach, preach. I can do it in a split second. Teach, 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 preach, preach. I can do it in a split second. Because I start working with both hands. Am I helping anybody in here? You got to work with both hands, both hands. You got to be so cold with both hands 
that you're just like Gideon. You were talking about the other night. When Gideon got down to the nitty gritty, the final test was for them to go to that water. And they had to get down. He said, the ones that left like a dog, you don't want them. But the ones that's got the weapon in the hand and scooping that water up drinking, them the ones you want to go to war with. Because why? Them people that work with both hands. Both hands, you got your eye up, and I'm watching, and I'm ready at the same time. That's how cold you got to be, that even when you refresh yourself, you're ready. Do I have any ready people in here right now? Lord have mercy, I'm out of time. So I'm just going to give you these other two, and we're just going to have to do it another time. Number three, the risk of being last minute. All right? I ain't got time to teach you. It's 12 o'clock. Y'all know y'all going to brunch. I don't even want to hear. Y'all get up and walk right out of here. I watch y'all. Y'all just walk right out of church. Okay? The teacher? No. I'm not going to, I'm just going to touch it, but I'm not going to teach it. I'm just going to touch it. I'm not going to teach it. Look at somebody and say, which one are you? This was the defining moment in that text. What was the defining moment? Write this down. Extended delay. Extended delay is what created the problem. That's what amplified who they were. Because you know who, you know what, but you don't know when. They didn't have a strategy, the other five. The five wise, they had a strategy. Some kind of way they decided to get the jars, but the other five didn't, okay? And it was that delay that caused an issue. So you had extended delay and then you had exhaustion, right? Exhaustion. Now, when you are prepared, you sleep well. When you're not, you're restless. And these particular ones got drowsy, that's what the text says, and they fell asleep. And when the scream came, the bridegroom is here, the prepared woke up. They didn't get ready. They were already ready. They stayed ready. All right? This is what preparation looks like. They got there, they were ready. They were ready before they went to bed, okay? So they put the things down. The others, the only oil they had was the oil that was in the lamp because they were too concerned about being now. Are y'all hearing me? You can't be concerned about just being now. Just as much power and strategy as it takes to get there, it takes even more to stay there. You have to get to a point to where you're trying to hit the stage and sustain. It does you no good to hit the stage one time and there's no sustainability with your gift. Your preparation will manifest itself and your sustainability will be visible to the world because you can do it on the drop of a dime. Doesn't matter when anybody asks you, you can do it because you went to sleep ready. I wish I had a witness here. You went to bed ready. You walked there ready. So waking up ready ain't nothing. So they woke up. And the ones that were not ready asked the ones that were, can I have some of your oil? And the ones that were ready, they said, you didn't help me carry this. I hope I'm painting this picture good enough for you. Because some of y'all give it up real easy. I was in a bad moment. Forget your moment. Oh, yeah, y'all didn't like that, did you? Look at what you hurt because you had a moment. Look at what you lost. Because you had a moment. You want somebody to have sympathy for you because you couldn't control it. 
I'm not saying that you don't deserve counseling or therapy, but don't come to me wanting what I carried, what it took all of my life to build, and you think I'm gonna give it to you because you got a sad story? Your story is not worth what I got. I don't care if you're losing your house. You bought the house, you bought the car, you bought the Gucci purse, you bought the Gucci shoes, you bought everything else. Why didn't you take it back when you bought the house? Don't post that now. Don't post that. Don't post that. Don't post that. Don't post that. But you want to come up to me where you know I got a hard time. You didn't think this was hard? You didn't think it was hard when I was working at McDonald's and Burger King? You didn't think it was hard? You didn't think it was hard? My daddy used to preach and then get in his car and drive and work graveyard shift. You didn't think that was hard? That was hard. So what the season that I am in right now is a manifestation. So I'm not going to risk not having enough because you didn't think enough to strategize for your own self and your own family. Oh my God, y'all the ones asked me to finish this. That's hard teaching right there, I know it is. It's hard teaching, but I've been there. My mama let me, my mama let me get put out. Matter of fact, she put me out. My mama found about seven, eight pounds of marijuana in the garage. She says, you get your black self out of here. I was 16, get your black self out of here. And was crying the whole time. She took my clothes, put them in the trash bag. And mama, I know you're watching and you can tell them it's the truth because I know you're on there. You know what I said to her? Can I at least have a, a, a bag? Like a suitcase? She said, no, it's my suitcase. Take this trash bag. <laughs> you know why? Because my mama said this. I'm not about to risk what I've worked for. Even though you are my son, I'm not going to lose our home and it's seized by, by policemen for drugs because you're my son. You get out. She cried, but she put me out. Is it worth the risk? It's not worth the risk. So if you're going to ask God for something, look at all the potential risks that's in your life. If God takes me here, who's going to be the risk that causes me to lose what I got? The risk of being last minute means that you may lose it all because you shared with the wrong person or you didn't schedule, you didn't get ready because that's what this text is about, getting ready. Let me move. Number four, we'll be done with it. The right to be in the room. The right to be in the room. You get in the room because you're ready. Okay? I remember this. Jasmine, Jasmine's my admin. I had left church one day, Dr. Tracy. And I was driving. I've never told this story publicly. This is the first time. I was driving. And I had gotten uh, seven miles from the church in Dallas. And my phone was on silent, but it had rang from like seven or eight different pastors at the church. So I picked them, uh, they had texted and called. I said, hey, what's going on? They said, Bishop said, uh, get up here. I said, man, I'm a long ways away. They said, man, get up here. Whew, turn around, I'm driving fast. Another pastor called, hey, man, where you at? I said, man, I just got the call. He said, well, man, you need to get here. Bishop, Bishop is in the hallway looking for you. I got out, car still running. Just ran in, security took my car. I go in, oh, breathing hard. He said, where you been? I said, I had left, Bishop, I'm sorry. He said, always stay around. You never know what's going to happen. I said, yes, sir. He said, uh, what's that country? Uh, I forgot the name of it. 
it was not Nigeria, but it's another one. A king from Africa was there. It wasn't Ghana. Uh, a king and his, 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 his mother, the queen mother, and the staff had come to church Sunday. I thought they came to church to hear him. So I walked in the room and I'm like, I'm serious. And the guy's like, I watch you all the time. And his mother says, please take a picture with him. Please take a picture. He loves your ministry. And I'm like, so I get on my knee beside the king and I took this picture. I've never posted it because it ain't for the world to see. It's for me. I got on my knee and I took this picture with the king. And then they showed me a picture of him in his royal clothes. He was, he was dressed regular. But I got in the room. I got in the room with royalty. That was the first day of many rooms that I got to start going into. But I got in those rooms, watch this, because both of my hands was full. You know how I got in those rooms? Watch this, driving the car. Bishop, where you need to go? I'm driving. Hey, I need you to go to the store and grab me some. Yes, sir. Yes. Hey, man, you over there taking him places. You over there being a chauffeur. Shut up. <laughs> I hope y'all getting some out of this. Serving, serving, serving will get you in the room. The first season of going in the room, this is what he told me. Don't talk. Just sit there. So I sit there. I'm the driver. But people see me preaching. So it was kind of like the thorn in the flesh. Like, yo, you cold, but you over here, you the butler. You the, you the driver. That's right. So I'm driving. I'm quiet. I'm driving. I'm quiet. I'm driving. I'm quiet. I'm preaching. I'm driving. I'm quiet. I'm preaching. Then he says, hey, I want you to be on this panel. What panel? Uh, it's a panel with Steve Harvey, a panel with uh, uh, Timberland. And uh, uh. I said, you want me to be on the panel with them? He said, yeah. You got a problem with it? I said, I ain't nobody. Only to you. He said, they all watch you. They all think you're amazing. He said, now you can talk. He said, when you come in the room, be you. Because no, neither one of them can beat you being you. That was the beginning of many, many many, many rooms that have even got me to your bishop to this day because I've served my way there. You have the right to be in the room when your preparation opens the door for you. There is no reason to go in the room if you're not prepared. And your preparation will vary as the room grows. There'll be times you go in the room where you're quiet. There'll be times where you're running the room. There'll be times where you're moderating the room. There'll be times when you're just supposed to just turn the lights on, turn the light off. Just thank God that you're in the room. All right, I'm done. Stand on your feet. I'm going to give you these last few notes, and I'm gonna, I want you to write them down. You can play. This is it. I want you to write this down. Four simple wisdom keys for maximizing. Four simple keys for maximize. Oh, they put them on the screen for me. Yep, there you go. Schedule. Number two. Supply. Can you put them all at the same time for them? Schedule. Supply. Sleep. And show up. Okay? You got to schedule. You got to supply. What is the supply? You got to have both hands full. Okay? What is the sleep? You should be able to rest well. And then when it's time to go, Show up. It's time to show up. Rest on your feet. Rest on your feet. We're going home.
Are y'all all right with that word today? Yeah. You grab hands with somebody before we walk out. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come in here today together and give your name to praise. We thank you. Because when somebody asks us which one are we, we're the wise ones. And we're going to take our lives by the horn and we're going to become exactly what you destined over our lives. This is the season for us to never be broke. This is, what, this is the season for us to be happy. This is the season for us to have joy, unspeakable joy and full of glory. This is the season for every snake to fall off of our lives, for them to be exposed for who they are, and for us to tread on them and move into our future. We're going into our destiny. We're going to maximize ourselves, and we're going to be who you called us to be. If you believe it, come on, shout hallelujah, give God glory. I'll be in the lobby.